Now, in the latest ProShare Bank Strength Index for 2023, four Nigerian Tier 1 banks and financial holding companies have maintained their top-ranking positions in the Nigerian banking industry, while two others dropped from Tier 1 to Tier 2 status in the rankings. The report is also predicting that Nigerian banks will need to innovate to retain their customer base and create uncontested markets, particularly with the growth of AI-supported fintech services in the banking sector. Now, while some banks may face challenges, especially Tier 2 banks, Tier 1 banks are expected to continue thriving. Tosin Ige, Head Research Services for ProShare, joins me now as we take a look at breaking down the report. Tosin, welcome to Business Edge. Thank you so much for joining me. Good morning. Thank you for having me. So let's start with a look at the banks that did ma uh, manage to retain their Tier 1 status, and that includes Access Bank, Guarantee uh, Trust Company, Zenith Bank, and of course, United Bank of Africa, or UBA. So what do they all have in common? What enabled them uh, to hold on to these prime positions and what have been some very interesting times in the financial and banking uh, services industry? Okay, thank you once again for having me. Um, truly, uh, the, the concept it, itself, the fugas, we're trying to, you know, uh, the tier ones are typically known as the, the fugas, but um, uh, what that has meant in before is that um, we, uh, the industry conveniently rank these uh, banks based on their asset, and, uh, but we did some other metrics, we, you know, expanded on those metrics so that um, uh, we are not in that hole of just ranking bank based on their asset, which may have its weaknesses. And so we came up with a more expanded metrics that, of course, put this bank then as being really objectively tier one banks. And so coming to that question, what still make them it uh, include their profitability, their risk management, their governance, uh, their efficiency, and, uh, and and the like. So those are the metrics that we use and that place this bank still as tier one. Because if you look at those banks you actually mentioned, uh, in our maiden edition, they, some of them still retain their position because they consistently uh, uh, done well using these metrics that I said. So mm -hmm. that's how we came about with these uh, banks. Okay, we'll get deeper into the metrics in just a bit. But the report does also mention that Stanbeck IBTC, as well as Fidelity Bank, dropped from the Tier 1 ranking to Tier 2. So can you tell us what happened to them? Um, okay, uh, let's let's look at it from this aspect. Uh, the report mainly is actually focusing on the the full year end 2022, and so the H1 2023 is just a a, a, a more like to prevent the performance of these uh, banks in 2023. But of course, you know, we did the report, so the report ought to have come out for some time. But with the delay we had in uh, the financial statement of some banks, so that kind of delayed the report to uh, uh, this October. And so that's why we also had to preempt the performance of uh, some of these banks for H1. So in um, full year 2022, truly, we have um, Stambik still maintaining that their position anyway. But um, uh, yes, as you said, truly, uh, Fidelity dropped out. But not so much that uh, Fidelity didn't do well. Um, a, a look at their financials actually shows that um, uh, they did well, even more than the 2021, because they were part of uh, the T1 bank in 2021. But for 2022, um, uh, they dropped from that metrics because um, the metrics that was used in 2021, we add this 2022 is an improvement, it's a, uh, a fresh look. Let me call it that way. We had a fresh look and, you know, and of course that leads to the introduction of some metrics and then rebalancing of the weight. So um, if you do well as a bank in terms of uh, profitability and then uh, uh, maybe in terms of cost to you, others do well more than you. So there may be that situation where you have to, you may drop in, uh, in from, from the metrics because there is a cutoff point and that's why we see 
uh, the likes of Fidelity uh, dropping in full year 2022. But I must say that uh, the bank is still within, it's, it's more like the, uh, on the watch list for ProShare, given that uh, their performance is too strong in, um, uh, in, in, in H1, in, in full year 2022, and also in H1. So it's because, it's mostly because of the rebalancing of the metrics that we'll see uh, some of those banks dropping out. But of course, um, uh, 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 Intel suggests that some of those banks are also, if, if they've seen the metrics and a number of them are trying and working towards actually improving along those metrics. Uh, I don't want to preempt your next question. Maybe we'll <laughs> go uh, further into those metrics. And, and that's where we're getting to now because this methodology that you use behind the ranking of uh, tier one and tier two banks, as the report says, has now evolved. Uh, and that's the latest ProShare Bank Strength Index for 2023. So you're looking at a broader range of criteria, which includes uh, efficiency mm. ratios, risk management, digital income as well. And this goes beyond the traditional measures of asset quality, profitability, and liquidity. Mm. So why the change? Why this expansion when we look at uh, the financial sort of um, situation of banks in Nigeria? Is there also something happening in the banking industry here in the country that's necessitating this evolution of the matrix that we're seeing from your report? Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, uh, before now, as I said, the concept of tier one is fixed, and so we just have uh, fugas. And um, uh, and I must say, give credit to um, Afri Invest. They also came up with uh, some metrics in terms of weighing the bank, and so they use. But their metrics actually overemphasize um, asset size. I think it's more like around fifty percent weight on asset size and then um, CAR with maybe 20% and then uh, MPLR and, 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 and one more metrics like that. But um, what we did is actually to put all of it into context, you know, uh, we use an industry weight. So when we're looking at the tier one, we're looking at uh, those the, th those with the strengths as those we, we can call the too big to fail bank, if I can mm -hmm. use that term. And so what we now did is to provide a framework and establish a standard uh, metrics for actually gauging the these banks and so uh, when we when, when when we did that we actually noted that uh, uh, there re, there are changing uh, there is a transition in the banking industry and one of it is, is that um, uh, uh, the tech, financial technology is actually revolutionizing uh, the banking system and so that led to the intro introduction of uh, the e-banking uh, uh, as, as a ratio of uh, gross earning into the metrics. And then also, we also look at uh, the profitability. We see that uh, even the Afri Invest metrics also didn't consider that. And you know, banks are often quite um, active or so vocal in announcing that they've made profit. So we had to also put uh, the profitability as a matrix uh, into the uh, formula. And then we also did the asset growth. So not just looking at the absolute value of the asset, we also look at how the assets are growing as a matrix and then uh, the governance so that um, uh, we look at the governance framework because we've seen in recent past that um, governance has been a major factor that actually affects banks. So uh, because of all of this, and of course, even the governance can look at the uh, old cost structure that banks is uh, that, that that many banks are transitioning into. Mm. This, of course, heightening the risk and of course complexify management. So we also we also have to introduce the risk uh, metrics into uh, the 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 methodology. And so because of this transition, specifically the fintech uh, the, the the evolution of uh, fintech into the banking space, and of course the financial holding company structure as well as uh, what we see across the globe, the um, asset management, uh, uh, asset liability management issue that some banks had on the global scene leading to their fall. So we also had to bring uh, those risk metrics into it. So there is, is actually a whole lot of um, uh, 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 weighting that goes into the uh, the metrics that was introduced because we, from our maiden editions, uh, we had um, operators coming in and then CFOs of bank um, uh, putting their input and saying, okay, yes, truly, your metrics are quite valid, but can we introduce this? So these are some of those things that we introduce in this 
uh, new reports. And that's why the metrics are, are quite uh, on that uh, on the high side compared to Afri Invest and of course also compared to uh, Made in Editions. Okay, so there's something you mentioned here that I want to quickly take you on, and that, of course, has to do with the financial holding companies. Uh, we've seen more banks in Nigeria move towards that kind of structure. And while uh, we hear what the positives are for the banks, I'd be interested in uh, asking if there are any positives in particular for consumers, for customers across Nigeria, when you have a bank moving into a financial holding company, making it a parent company uh, with ability to do a bit more. So do we see customers in Nigeria gaining from this trend towards financial holding companies? Um, okay, uh, the gain more often than known is actually for the uh, investors in these uh, banks and um, it's not much of an issue for uh, the customer given that um, uh, even in the financial holding company structure that we're talking about, banks still account for the largest proportion of that structure. We have uh, a rough estimate suggests that uh, the bank within the holding company structure is around um, 70 to 80 percent in terms of their share of the total um, capacity of the financial holding company. So uh, uh, the, the banking operation continues and so it doesn't leave any uh, risks per se for the customer. It's, it's, it's mainly the gain is for the bank and of course their uh, investors. Not, not so much of a risk for the um, everyday customer. Banking operation will continue. All right. So one of the key takeaways from the reports is that dynamism would be a key feature for surviving business disruptions beyond 2023. You, of course, mentioned mm -hmm. some of the global issues we've seen that have bled into uh, the banking system here in Nigeria and across the world as well. But what do you what do you see? What do you envisage when it comes to some form of disruption or the disruption that our banking system needs to be ready for? What could come into play? Um, okay, thank you. Um, let me say that one of the major things that we recognize in the report is that um, uh, the concept of bank as it is is actually uh, dead. And um, we say that because uh, the traditional model of um, banks or the traditional concept of bank, which of course uh, someone says is just um, banking as a concept, bank, bank now as a concept is just that you are licensed by the regulator, in this case, the CBN, to carry out the intermediation of uh, you know, funding from the um, excess uh, segment, uh, segment of the society to the deficit segment. But uh, we are saying that concept is more going into extinction or even dead because banking is the main thing. And when I mean banking, what I mean is that banking from the dictionary meaning of it is um, the ability to bridge that gap of, you know, redistributing from the surplus side to the deficit side. And we see that the evolution of technology has made that possible in this day and age. We've seen uh, even the telecom company going into the banking space. And that's why we see a whole lot of um, uh, uh, new banks now. The concept is actually new banks. So what it then means is that um, a bank that is uh, uh, that is still stereotyped to uh, the concept of banking, you know, the brick and mortar system of banking may actually be facing that challenge. That's why one of the metrics we introduce into the report is actually that uh, digital income, because we find out it is becoming a very quite significant proportion of bank. And uh, uh, our engagement with uh, CFOs of bank also suggests that even in terms of uh, the composition of earnings, you know, uh, broadly there is the uh, interest income and then there is a non-interest income. Actually, the interest income, which of course relates to that um, uh, uh, the traditional uh, model of bank, the loan and advances, and of course interest earned on it, is actually on the decline. What banks are using now to show themselves is actually the non-interest uh, 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 income which they are making from fees and commission in some of their digital platforms. So mm -hmm. this has become a major component that we feel it is and we feel it will continue to be one of those trends that will actually disrupt the financial system. So it's a major transition that we see that the bank is going onto because as I said, uh, PSBS are growing and they are, um, I, I can say, for sure that they are really growing in terms of the 
PSB. But of course, while it presents that competition for the banks, we feel that banks still have the capacity to actually outcompete those things because they have the uh, the, the customer base. So, uh, but uh, as I said, it's a transition that we think is shaping out and it will disrupt bank. And on the other hand, also, as I said, uh, what we just discussed right now, the holding company structure may also begin to disrupt the banking system because uh, it also feeds into the, uh, the digital bank because we've seen a number of these banks taking up um, uh, the payment service company as subsidiaries. And so this, this, this actually broadens their operation, of course, and it makes it easy. So they, they, they are not losing their customers to uh, the, the new entry. Rather, they are still maintaining them within the same structure. So uh, that's why this, 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 these two trends are actually the what we feel are the major uh, dynamism that is shaping out in terms of the uh, financial service industry. OK. so. When this report came out, there was, or at least for now, there has been some speculation that the banking industry would possibly soon start a new recapitalization drive due to the current economic realities on the ground. So is this really looking like the next logical step with the situation of uh, banks in Nigeria? And what could also be driving the potential recapitalization? Talk to us about that. Um, okay, thank you. Um, in terms of uh, the recapitalization of banks, it's been one of those things we've also argued that um, uh, banks may need recapitalization. And the major arguments, I say major because it seems to be the major argument for uh, analysts is that um, when you look at when the uh, banks were recapitalized to that um, 25 billion as it were, um, it was a conversion from I think around two fifty thousand uh, dollars that you know gave us that um, uh, uh, that value then. But we're saying that um, uh, bank the 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 FS depreciation has actually led to the eroding of the value of that twenty five billion now. And so um, if, if you look at it, yes, when if we even if we want to gauge it, I think I should put it this way. From both sides, from the Naira side, that 25 billion now uh, is too small for banks to actually finance uh, capital projects on their own individually. And we've also seen that uh, not many banks, in fact, I think it is even all, are even made, matching up with that um, uh, that. Uh, uh, capital requirement, and mm. so many of them are not matching up with that requirement. Uh, and so, a, a number of them, when there is a massive project in the system, take for instance, like the Dangote refinery, there had to be a consortium that will actually finance that project. So, no single bank is enough to finance that because, of course, uh, they have their operational capital and even their capital base are actually not uh, adequate to finance uh, such projects. And of course, in the report, we also look at, compare uh, the Nigerian banks with other African countries, and we we'll see that um, uh, Nigerian banks are, you know, lagging behind major, mm -hmm. lagging behind major bank uh, in South Africa, in Morocco, in Egypt, and the rest of them. So that's really, that, that's one of the arguments for that recapitalization. And as I said, as I said, on the other hand, the dollar value of that, uh, of the extant uh, capital requirements has actually been eroded. And so uh, when you look at the foreign project, no, Nigerian banks are not able to finance foreign projects be with the current uh, capital requirements. So this argument is actually one of those reasons why we are also, um, as, as analysts and in the report, also supportive of the need for recapitalization of the banking system in Nigeria. Okay, so Tosin, before we go, uh, we've seen four banks retain their tier one status, two dropping down to mm -hmm. tier two. Uh, but as you said, there's been an influx of neo banks as well, neo banking in the, in the country and mm -hmm. in the economy. Mm -hmm. uh, we've yeah. seen AI as well bringing in so many different solutions for mm -hmm. fintech. So, in the face of economic mm -hmm. uncertainties, global and local shocks, disruptions, and uh, differences coming to the banking sector, we have seen that overall many Nigerian banks have demonstrated their resilience. What do you think is responsible for this? How have they been resilient? when we have an economy that's going through what the economy is going through? Oh, yeah. Um, Nigerian banks truly really have been resilient. And um, 
uh, when you look at the financials, the recently uh, released financial, that I think speaks to the heart of the matter. And um, I say that because we we'll see that um, uh, Nigerian banks have also preempted that uh, the Naira will continue to lose its values. And so we see them holding a large proportion of uh, foreign assets. And so uh, that gave them that when, when, so when, they, when the depreciation came about, and they were able to still have that gain, foreign translation gain in their book because they've actually held so much of um, uh, foreign assets. So that gave them that buffer. It's one of those edging that we see the banks have been doing. And on the other hand also, don't forget, I just said now that um, a number of Nigerian banks are, no more, are, are not so much depending on um, the lending to the real sector per se. Uh, we did that um, exposure of Nigerian banks to the different sector and find that actually on the average, it seems to have diversified that they are lending to the real sector. So they are not so much exposed to one sector. But again, when you want to put that into context, you even ask that how much do they even have to lend to this sector? So mm -hmm. Uh, given that the CBN has sterilized so much, I think maybe if you put this, uh, the, the, the statutory and the discretionary uh, CRR together, you're looking at over 50% of their uh, of their loan as actually uh, of their deposit has actually been sterilized with the CBN. So it, it, it gives us an idea that uh, really they have little to lend out, and so. Uh, banks have actually been strategic in their uh, management of their asset and liability. So that's why we see a number of them making so much from the non-interest income because we've seen them diversified into okay. um, other uh, non-interest income per se. So that gave them that resilience. And, you know, even despite the, uh, the economic issue that we may be having, the disruptions on the economy, we've seen that um, financial transactions will continue to go on. And that's why we've seen a whole number of these, uh, the big tier bank, the large tier one banks actually moving into this uh, digital space so that they are hanging within the digital space. And on the same time, they are trying to manage their assets and liability properly. And so it doesn't give them that translation issue as okay. we've seen on the global scene. So all of these issues have actually been able to balance uh, the earning of bank. And that's why it seems they are resilient because uh, uh, so the banking sector per se are actually being the one. They are very strategic. And I think was given all right, to them, they have quite been strategic in looking for ways to actually uh, keep the business of banking going. And that's why uh, the market indicators also shows that we see the market, uh, the banking index actually performing so well because okay. investors see the actions of these um, bankers. All right, Tosin, we have to leave the conversation there because of time. Tosin Ige, Head Research Services for ProShare, thank you so much for joining me as we looked at uh, four Nigerian banks retaining their top, uh, their tier one ranking, two going down to tier two, but also looking at the general health of the industry. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, so we'll go on a quick timeout. Now, when we come back, we have international business headlines. Then we look at the Central Bank of Nigeria lifting Forex restrictions on some 43 items. Stay with us.